church, take your Bibles to the book of James chapter 1. James chapter 1, good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. And uh, what an awesome spring, summer, or spring Sunday morning rather. And uh, how many enjoyed all the rain yesterday? Uh, I, I look like the Jordan River going through my backyard yesterday. Uh, we get a lot of the, the water coming from uh, the street behind us, and it was just pouring through. We got to our, our backyard, and we have a little fire pit area that's kind of raised up, and it was splitting. And half of us going one way, half of us going the other way. And uh, it looked like you could grab a tube and ride for a few, a few miles uh, in the little river we had going on. But good to see you. I love the spring. I love all of the flowers, the trees, our grass is finally turning green. And uh, all the good times this year. Looking forward to diving into the Word of God. Thank you. What an awesome thing. Last Sunday, five people uh, getting baptized in the service. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. What an awesome thing. I was talking to someone just yesterday. She says, I can't remember uh, being, she said, for, for years, not even seeing five people in the church she used to go to, she said, getting baptized in, in 15 years. So uh, five in one Sunday, uh, what an awesome thing. And God gets all the glory for that. Building is filling back up. People are getting excited. People are getting saved. Lives are being changed. Last Sunday, we had our coffee with the pastor. Got to meet some really awesome people that God is sending through our doors, having an opportunity to minister to. I wonder, we're, we're, there's, today's our second uh, Sunday in the series, When Life is Hard, God is Good. Looking at trials and uh, this season of life, sometimes we go through seasons where we, we experience suffering or trials or persecution. Maybe you wonder, you ask questions like, why are these things happening in my life? Is it, why does it seem uh, that some people can't get a break. You ever been there? You're sitting there going, it seems like we just keep hitting one trial after another. Maybe it, it's, it isn't right. It's not fair to those of us who are trying to start over. Why do things always have to happen to my family? Maybe you're asking some of these questions. I mean, I know it's not just mine, but I thought it would have stopped when I got rid of some of my pain. Did I do something to deserve this? I just want to give up. I want to fight. I want to run. I hate this season of my life. Most of us have been there. And at times, we feel like throwing in the towel. There's times where even the most committed Christian, uh, when just we lost uh, Dr. Charles Stanley just this week, and uh, when you think about uh, the impact that he has had on uh, Christianity in America, and it's uh, I remember in high school uh, going and, and getting to sit under his preaching one Sunday and, and being at First Baptist Atlanta, and it was just amazing to see the impact that he's made on so many people's lives, and lives have been touched by the gospel. But folks, sometimes you feel like throwing in the towel. Sometimes even the most committed Christian can feel like, hey, why is God uh, beating up on me? Why am I facing these trials over and over and over? And it's okay sometimes to ask and to, to process this in our thinking. Most of all, we hate going through tough times. We like living on the mountaintops. Uh, we like uh, being in the, in the victory lane, so to speak. And, but the reality is, in life, not everyone gets a trophy. And we laugh about that, but folks, we've created a mentality that's not reality. We've created a mentality where everybody wins. And I think just the other week they were talking about uh, two sports team and they were going to invite the losing team to also come to the White House. And they're like, hold on, that's not how this works. Everybody doesn't get a trophy. Everyone doesn't go away with the honorable mention. I, I got an honorable mention one time on an art project in elementary school. And uh, I, it was kind of like saying, uh, good job, you know, try again next year. You know? And my mom kept that picture of a giraffe that had this matting all around it. You could frame it. And I thought to myself, that is the ugliest giraffe I've ever seen. But, you know, my mom was so proud that I had got an honorable mention. And that just means everybody got a, a, a ribbon. But, you know, that's how it works. Sometimes we think, why am I going through these difficult times? As we continue in the series, today we're looking at when life is hard, why do trials come? Why do they come? And the why question sometimes is the hardest hitting question. It's the question that lingers the longest because we look at it uh, as if we're looking at the, trying to figure out the, not just that question, but the, it brings up other questions. 
I wonder this morning, am I willing not only to hear God's answers, but to embrace them? Think about that. When we ask the question, why, and, and I mentioned last Sunday, sometimes I, I hear people say, that I just can't wait till I get to heaven. I've got this whole list of questions, you know. I'm going to sit there. Y'all going to be sitting for a while because, I mean, I've got like 500 questions that I'm going to ask. And even this week, my dad and I were, were riding down the road and we were talking about it. I said, I, said, I wonder how much... We're going to know about each person when we get to heaven. You know, there's parts of it that Scripture doesn't give us every single detail. And, and I'm thankful for that. It leaves a lot to, to look forward to and to anticipate. But I, I wonder oftentimes, like, well, it, you know, when, when Dr. Stanley entered into the pearly gates, as we like to talk about, Peter's always standing there at the pearly gates. Every joke and story you ever hear is told about that. But when he walked in, is there a line of, 3,000 people saying that, hey, I got saved under one of your sermons on TV 35, 55 years, he was 91 years old, 55 years ago, and during the preaching of the word, and thank you for being a faithful servant, thank you for preaching, and you wonder, will you know people like that, will you have all those answers, and, but the questions often are, you know, what if, am I willing, not only to hear God's answers, but am I willing to embrace them? If I was able to ask those questions, would I embrace? In order to get us ready, let's take some time right now just to, to open up with prayer. And I want to encourage you, tell God nothing is off limits. As we go to prayer this morning, say, God, I'm going to set aside all of the other distractions. God, I want you to speak to my heart. Oftentimes, we can sit guilty here as charged. We can sit there and go, I'm so glad so-and-so is in the building this morning. They need to hear this message. And, uh, or maybe you're thinking of a coworker, and you're going, I'm going to text them right now and have them tune in online. But the reality is sometimes God wants us to be willing to say, God, I want to listen. I want to hear what you have to say, what your word has to say. And, and maybe you say this morning in prayer, in prayer, God, it's too hard. I'm not sure I want to even hear what you have to say. You ever been in that moment? Like, I'm not sure if God answered the question I'm not sure I'm even ready to receive it, but God, I, I'm willing for you to make me willing. God, if you choose not to change my circumstances, please change me. Heavenly Father, would you speak to our hearts this morning? As difficult of a subject as this is to address, God, there are so many questions that go through our minds and I believe oftentimes the, the devil, he's waging war on our minds because he knows he can't have our heart. God, I pray this morning that you would just arrest our attention and God, we would set aside anything that's distracting us. God, would you speak to us? God, would you help us to understand the whys? And God, would you give us the, the heart and the, and the endurance to, to listen and to, to wait for you to speak clearly to us and show us uh, with, through wisdom, through experience, Lord, through growing in our faith, God, would you show us the parts of our lives that maybe we don't even know that we're ready to hear this morning, but God, would you open our hearts, help us to be receptive. God, would you change us from the inside out? God, would you begin to do a, a mighty work and God... I believe that breakthroughs can happen today. I believe, believe that, that uh, peace can be found, that joy can be re renewed, and, and God, we can experience that true happiness as a follower of Jesus this morning as we understand the, the, the why about trials. God, would you speak to hearts? Would you transform lives? Those that may not know you as Lord and Savior, God, may today be that moment of their decision to trust you. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen. James chapter 1, it's a book written by, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by the, the human author is James, the brother of Jesus, addressed to people who had experienced pain and persecution and had been scattered abroad in many different places. It's similar to the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament that has 
nuggets of biblical truth. In fact, if you're looking for an encouraging word from the Word of God, the book of James is a great place for, for believers to start and to understand because it speaks. It's just like one right after another, giving us truths that help us in our walk with Christ. Very practical book. And if we have faith that works, it will be seen through how we face trials in chapter 1, how we treat people in chapter 2, how we talk in chapter 3, we might all depart there for a while, how we deal with sin in our lives in chapter 4, and how we pray in chapter 5. It's interesting that the very first topic that James tackles is how to treat our trials. How do we deal with suffering? How do we deal with trials? So in James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet various trials of various kinds, this might be one of the hardest verses to comprehend because you're, you read it and you're like, can I rejoice in the midst of trial? Can I rejoice in the midst of, of deep, heavy burdens? Can I rejoice in times of adversity? What he's saying is just count it. Count it all joy. The word count carries with the idea of counting, obviously, and It's literally the idea of pressing your mind down on something. The picture is one of leading our mind through a process of reasoning uh, to arrive at a conclusion. Some parents do this when they want their kids to get to obey. And they'll say, all right, uh, you better, and you'll give some instruction. And you're like, one, two, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, three. And and the parents will start counting. Sometimes I'm in a a, a place of business and I'll hear a a parent start counting. I was like, well, it's about to, it's going to hit the fan. I mean, somebody's about to get in trouble. At at my house, let me just give you a little uh, heads up. There's never any counting. The moment they said what you're supposed to do, it was direct, immediate obedience. And you say, why is that? Because that one, two, 2.5, 2.5, 2 and 3 quarters, you're giving them a chance to continue doing wrong. And, and what happens is my dad always says this, he says, he says, if I'm telling you don't run across the street, he says it's because I know the danger. Maybe there's a car that's coming that you can't see or you can't hear. And he says, if you take that third step, you might be smashed by a car. So he says, it's immediate obedience. When God speaks... He's expecting us to yield completely to his control. He's wanting us to say no to the devil and yes to the Holy Spirit and his leading and his working in our life. So my parents never counted, but the, the, the tense here conveys urgency. We're to weigh our worries, calculate our trials, and put them in perspective. The challenging part of all of this is that some of us have a hard time even getting to three. Why? Because the junk in our lives has destroyed any joy that we're having. Sometimes we're so angry, we're so burdened, we're so upset with God because of something sometimes that happened 30 years ago that we can't experience joy at all in our lives. And it's it's a wall that we've placed around our lives. You say, well, I'm just trying to protect myself. No, what happens is God's Holy Spirit can't even break through because we have, we've, we've, we've cordoned ourselves off. We, we've said, God, I don't believe you truly love me. And say, I don't believe that you care about me, that you have my needs close to your heart. And what we're saying is, God, I don't fully trust you. Listen to yourself. Listen to ourselves. What happens is when we can't count it joy, when we fall into various trials of of, of different kinds, what we're saying is I don't trust the God who created me, the God who saved me, the God who's sovereign and holy and just overall. I don't trust him. That's exactly what we're saying. Some of us during COVID even got to points where fear was crippling us to the point I can't trust God fully because I'm so scared. God help the church who's become so scared of God because they don't trust him fully in every area of their life. What I'm saying is, at the end of the day, we have to trust God completely. Weigh our worries against the fact God is more than able to heal, 
to, to raise us up to, to whatever the, the issue is. I like what Warren Wiersbe says. He says, our values determine our evaluations. He says, if we value comfort more than character, trials will upset us. He says, if we value the material and physical more than the spiritual, he says, we will never be able to count it all joy. If we live only for the present, forget about the future, the trials will make us bitter, not better. Friends, at the end of the day, we need to recognize why it is that we exist. It's not for our pleasure. It's ultimately for his purpose to bring glory and honor and praise. So the life of a true Christian is all about displaying the superiority of God, of the life of Christ being lived out in my life. Whatever we're facing, whether it's a health crisis, a, a money problem, a, a prodigal child, a relationship that's gone sour, depression, anxiety, any of those things, right now, right here in this place, in this very situation, we have an opportunity to allow Jesus Christ to shine in and through us. The world is looking to see, is there something truly to being a follower of Jesus? Is there really something to having a relationship with Christ? Studies show that those who find their purpose in life, on average, end up living seven years longer than those who don't. So he says, count it all joy, the unanimous testimony of the writers of the New Testament is that we can find joy in the midst of tribulation. In 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Ultimately, one day, we're going to stand before Jesus face to face. All of the trials in this life are going to pale in comparison they pale in comparison to what jesus suffered and how he suffered in blood and died on the cross but folks one day that glory is going to be completely revealed we're going to see full picture jesus was at work all the while while i was going through trials and when i was wondering where is god on 9 11 where is god in this health crisis where was god when i lost my job where was god when i lost my house god is on his throne Instead of whining this morning, we can worship. Instead of telling people we're surviving, we can tell people we're thriving and give testimony of what Jesus has done. The only way I know to do this is to recognize there's a purpose in all of our problems. James is not saying our trials are joyful in themselves. He says there are means to an end which is joyful. Ultimately, Jesus Christ will be glorified. In other words, joy in trials comes from knowing that what the outcome is will ultimately be used for our good and for his glory. We tend to equate happiness with joy, but the two are, are, are very different ideas. Ultimately, one, each comes from a different source. One comes from the world around me. The other originates directly from the Holy Spirit uh, uh, of God. And so happiness is conditional. And it's dependent upon what's happening to me. But if my circumstances aren't favorable, I'm unhappy. Think about it. We complain when there's not enough rain and everything's dry and the, the grass is dying. Man, we need some rain around here. And then we have a day like yesterday where the, the skies open up and what do we do? We complain about the rain. Am I right? Anybody else tracking with me? We complain about how cold it is in the winter, and then we have a hot day. I mean, I remember some, we've had a day in January that was like 80 degrees, and you're like, man, I'm burning slam up. It's so stinking. What's wrong with the weather? And I mean, we start complaining. We're in North Carolina. What did you expect? <laughs> we have all four seasons, sometimes in the same day you know it's just how it is and then we complain about you know i just uh, the winter's so depressing and then all of a sudden spring starts and then there's pollen and we complain about that and then before long it's memorial day and it's hot and we're complaining about how hot it is and we can't wait till the fall and then the fall and we find something to complain about every single day we get in the drive-through and we're you're spending 
Not even now, it's not even five dollars at Starbucks. It's like six dollars. We, you know, Dave Ramsey calls it five bucks. And when you think about it, it's hard to even drive through the drive-through over there. I mean, it, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm literally bleeding out six dollars just to have a, a a cup of coffee. And and if folks, but you, the reality is, we 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 complain because it takes too long. But yet we want it hot and we want it cold or perfectly temperatured to our liking. And, and you go through a drive through and you're like, are they killing the cow as we speak? I mean, how long? Can, and, but you get a, a cold burger or cold fries? We all complain. I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm the only one that's, it's, uh, it's how we work. We are so consumed with having everything our way. James McDonald says, joy is a supernatural delight. In the person, purposes, and people of God. It's totally different than happiness. Joy comes from knowing Jesus and understanding he is very much in control. So he says, count it all joy, my brothers. The word brothers is a term of affection. It communicates that we're all part of the family of God. When you meet trials, uh, the King James Version says, or the New King James says, when you fall into trials... And sometimes that's how it feels. You feel like we, we fall into it, but you're minding your own business, and bam, you're, you ran the car in the ditch. We, 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 we've deviated. We've gotten off course, gotten off track. But it says, it doesn't say if, it says when you fall into trials. When you face trials of various kinds. In the Greek, many, many words are used, but the same phrase is used and the Greek in the Old Testament to describe the Hebrew, Joseph's coat of many colors. It's varied, it's many. Some suffering is tough and tragic. But folks, trials are difficult. They can be devastating. And we should never wish that we had someone else's trials. Uh, I've often thought walking down the hall of a hospital and you look in a room and Sometimes it's tragic. I remember visiting someone in the burn center at, at UNC, and someone told me, he said, as you walk down the hallway, do not look in the rooms. Well, that's kind of like telling a kid, you know, we're going to a candy store, but you can't have anything. But you look in those rooms, it's one heartache after another. One trial after another, one tragedy after another, and you realize I don't. I'll keep my problems all day long because there are so many people that are dealing with things that are far weightier and heavier than mine. And Erwin Lutzer reminds us, he says, God often puts us in situations that are too much for us. And folks, this goes against the grain because we often say God doesn't put too much on me. That's not in Scripture. It's not in Scripture. God often puts us in situations that are too much so that we'll learn that no situation is too much for Him. Screenshot that. Capture that. Write that down because He does allow us into situations that are too much for us. Apart from His power and His strength. And folks, do you know that what God's number one purpose is for you and for me he says, to make us more like Jesus, he'll use the junk, the trials of our lives to get us there. There are some benefits that come from bad things. So let's look, number one, trials produce staying power. Trials produce staying power. Verse 3 says, you know that the testing of your faith produces what, church? Steadfastness. He's saying there's a purpose, there's a method, there's a process. The word that James uses is steadfastness. Also translated patience or endurance. The Greek word comes from two words. One to remain and the other one means under. The testimony of our faith produces the ability to remain under pressure. This is counter to how most of us react during a trial because we want out. We want to get on top. We, want to, we, we, we don't want to be under the pressure, under the gun so to speak. And he wants us to stick with it, to hang in there. To not bail on our marriage. To not bail on our children. Quitting short circuits the good that God wants to bring from the bad. As a pastor, 
growing up and going to seminary and, and going to school and studying and preparing for, for being in ministry. Lots of people I went to school with, they have been, some of them have been to, in, in the 20, I've been, in, been here almost 26 years. Some I know have been in more than 10 churches, some 15 in, in that same time period. The temptation, and I'm just, I'm going to be completely transparent. The temptation is, the moment things get a little bit difficult, let's pop out from under the pressure and let's go to the next church. Let's pop out and well, I'll go to a bigger place, get more money, uh, get more prestige, or I can move up the ranks and, and somebody else is going to recognize my, my hard work and, my, and where I've come and how far up the ladder I've climbed. And folks, the reality is, is oftentimes even pastors will bounce from church to church and they never stay long enough to see the power of God at work. Sometimes I look around and I'll be honest, there's been temptations over the years that say, hey, what, you could get a much bigger church or you could go to a place that... It's not about that. The reality is, is oftentimes, and I'm putting myself in this situation, we stay long enough to where the trials start and then we're like, okay, I'm out, boom. I'm, I'm moving on. I, I'm looking. I'm searching for a job tomorrow. I, I'm on. In fact, I'm on my phone right now, Pastor. Everybody, you're looking. I'm looking to see what job openings are coming up this week. You know, and I'm trying to look for a way out. The reality is, is sometimes God wants us to remain under the pressure so He can perfect His work in our life. Quitting short circuits the good that God wants to bring from the bad. God chooses what we go through. He chooses how we go through it. We, excuse me, we choose how we go through it. And sometimes it's people are, don't want to remain under the trials that they face. Uh, uh, James McDonald surveyed 100 people to find out what they wanted to do instead of hanging in there. The top four answers were, I want to complain. That's like 99% of Americans. Uh, we're going to let people know how upset we are with the frustrations. You know, anytime you're about to type a, a, a negative review on a, on a company, why don't you take it and say, I'm going to wait 24 hours before I post that. Do you realize those, those comments are out there until Jesus comes, and then they're still going to be there because they're not saved. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be it's gonna be out there for all of eternity, you know? And you say, man, I'm telling you, that was the worst waitress I've ever seen, blah, 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 blah. And, you, and you're like a, a keyboard warrior, and you're telling everybody how bad everything is. Do you realize behind that is a business owner who has given every blood, sweat, and tears to build that business there, and you're destroying their reputation in a community where someone did have a bad day. Someone was going through a trial. Have you ever watched a waitress sometimes in the stress of man? Everyone needs to work in food service at least one time. One time. I worked at the Hardy's next door and then I graduated and moved next door. You know, but the reality is, is, you know, you need to have the experience of someone throwing the food in your face or, or yelling at you or cursing you out because the reality is life is hard. Sometimes you start talking, so what if you said to your waitress or your waiter, hey, we're getting ready to pray as a family. Is there anything that we can pray specifically for for you? What would that do to them? I promise you, whatever their struggle is, it's going to surface, and, and they're going to be, would you pray? My wife and I are going through a difficult time. We're, 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 our family is struggling in this area, and, and who knows? That we want to complain. We want to lash out. Uh, that was the second response. Unfortunately, we often take it out on the people closest to us. I want to bail. I, I want to. I want to get out. This isn't what I signed up for when I got married. That's not why I became a mom or a dad. And you get to those teenage years, and you're like, "Woo!" I mean, what in the world has happened to our family? I mean, that little angel that was so sweet and cute has turned into a, a monster, and they're they're screaming at you, and you're like, "Woo!" Now we have college age kids, and you're like, "It's a whole different season." And and I was holding my, my little niece a few minutes ago before the service, and I thought, I miss this age so much. 
But I don't want that age ever again until I have grandkids. Because then you spoil them and send them home and never have to change another diaper. You know, whatever. whatever. You don't have to deal with the attitude, but I, we want to bail. And then, or we want God to take us out. Sometimes we've even come to the point where, like, I'd rather be dead than go through this problem. Secondly, trials lead to life transformation. Verse 4. Once we persevere, our trials can lead to transformation, life change. That's what God's goal is. Verse 4 says, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. Read that last phrase with me, church. Lacking in, in nothing. You want to be mature? You want to be perfect? You want to be complete? You want to be made whole? The idea here is the steadfastness brings us to the intended end. If we persevere under pressure, we will become mature. The phrase lacking in nothing literally it means all the necessary parts are present. Any father in the building who's had to put together presents on Christmas Eve night or, or, or you know, they're trying to get a, a graduation present together or a birthday present and... I mean, have you ever sat through, I mean, I would like to meet the person who came up with the parts list. I mean, can I just beat them in the head for just, just once, you know, and I, we can all stand in line because, I mean, as a dad, you're like, and I tell my wife it all the time, I said, there's, there's so many extra parts left over, and she doesn't believe me. I mean, she literally thinks that there's exactly, what you, something is wrong. You didn't put this thing together right, and no, there's like, I was putting together a ring camera the other day at my house, and there was like 14 extra screws. Because depending on what the screw holes are like in the, the junction box in, your, in the corner, the eave of your house, it could be any number of sizes. And I'm sitting here going, I don't even know which one. None of them look right, you know. And so I'm trying one, then the whole light starts falling out of the ceiling. And then before long, I got it. I should have called an electrician. But the reality is, is it's just lacking in nothing. We have all the necessary parts if you want to be mature and finished with no needs, we must learn how to stay under suffering. James McDonald writes this. I want you to get it. He says, if staying put was easy, if submitting to what God allows and giving up was simple, everyone would be doing it. The fact is, most Christians are going round and round with God about the very same things because they change scenery or marriage, or job, or church, rather than remaining under the trial and letting God change. This is sobering, church. So often, we're like, well, let me just change my scenery, change the circumstances, and the reality is God is saying, I want to change you. There's nothing wrong with the, the scenery, the problem is with me. God wants to change me. And while I keep rearranging the deck chairs and trying to play the, 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 uh, the violin, the, the Titanic is still sinking. The reality is, is God wants to change my heart. He wants to change my life. John Eldridge tells the story of a Scottish discus thrower and a I had one of our young men that uh, throws a disc because I do not even, I'm not going to even claim to know how to hold this. He showed it to me and he was trying to demonstrate it. Oh, and I asked him if he'd come up here this morning. He said, not really. I don't really want to do that. But he had a Scottish, Scottish discus thrower from the 19th century. He lived days before uh, the professional trainers had developed the skills. So he worked at developing his skills out in the highlands. He made his own discus from the description he read in a book. What he didn't know was that the competition discus was made of wood with an outer rim of iron. His discus was made of pure metal four times the, the actual weight of an actual discus. This committed Scotsman trained day after day, laboring under the burden of extra weight. He marked the record distance and kept working until he could throw that far. And of course, 
when he arrived at the competition, he was handed the official wooden discus. He threw it like a tea saucer. He set new records, and for years, many of his competitors could not touch him. As Eldridge reflected on this story, he said, so that's how you do it. You train under a great burden. Oftentimes, we want to go through life and just coast. We want to just breeze through and autopilot everything and just kind of go through the the motions of this world. But God's saying, he's just just going to require you to be under the pressure, under the gun, so to speak, so that I can perfect you, mature you to a point where God is most glorified in your life. We see thirdly, God gives wisdom to help us understand. In James 1, 5, he says, it's one of the verses that gets often quoted, but it's often taken out of context. We'll remind you, when, you're, when you've been learning to consider it pure joy as you face trials, we focus on some of the things that trials produce in our lives. Having said all of that, most of us are still, that we're going to have questions. It's normal It's a normal human response to ask God, why? God is promising here he gives wisdom when we're wondering why we're going through such trials. Verse 5, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. It's okay to ask why. He knows us. He cares about every detail of of our lives he says he gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him as we looked last week wisdom refers to the ability to judge correctly and then to follow with correct conduct it should change us so we see god gives generously it's the, in the present tense which shows god keeps giving and giving and giving Reminds me of our greater things uh, theme from la- verse from last year, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. So God gives generously. God also gives graciously. Notice when, we, when God gives wisdom, he's not out to find fault with us. He's not trying. He's, he gives it to us all liberally, freely graciously without playing favorites but only giving wisdom to a few he offers his wisdom on the on the matter for those of us in christ we need to claim the promise of romans 8 in verse 1 there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus what happens is god forgives he cleanses last week We talked about understanding the difference between a a consequence of my sin or just a trial that we're facing because the response is different. Uh, If if I've fallen into sin, I need to confess it, repent, and turn from it, turn back to God. God restores that right relationship. But maybe it's just a trial that God has saw fit to allow me to endure, to experience. And what we're saying is, God, I want you to speak to me. Show me from your word. Show me through prayer. Show me through my relationship with God exactly what it is you're trying to teach me. We need wisdom in our trials so we don't waste our trials and miss the lesson God's trying to teach us. Ask him for staying power power even while we're suffering right now. And then fourthly, ask God to deal with your doubts. Ask God to deal with your doubts. Verse 6 says, let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. If you and I don't really want to stand up under and know what it's like that God grow, wants us to grow, verse 7 says it's like a slap in the face. He says the person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Do you really want wisdom? Do you really want to know God's heart on the matter? then we'll be willing to receive whatever it is that God wants to do in us. Trials included. Verse 8 says, he is like a double-minded man, unstable 
in all his ways. John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress called this Mr. Facing Both Ways. He said a doubter is like someone with two souls, a fence sitter who's trying to have it both ways. I want what God wants, but I don't want to, I don't want to deal with the trials. I want to grow, but I also want to gripe. I want to learn, but I'm tired of feeling like a loser. I want to get better, but I kind of like staying bitter. I want to be reconciled, but the thought of revenge seems so nice. What happens is, God is trying to perfect us, and oftentimes we get in the way of the Holy Spirit trying to change us. Say, well, I'll just short sucker that. I'll cut off that whole relationship. I'll end this right now. I'll quit that job. I'll go to a different church. I'll move. I'll. The reality is, is God is ta- takes time. Patience doesn't come overnight. Patience, it, it, it's a virtue. It takes time. But what the, the word was used to describe someone unsettled, unsteady, staggering, reeling like a drunken person. He says, that person, someone has said in their heart and their mind are divided, trials will tear them apart. I've seen people, Christian people, that went through trials and it turned them further away from God because they were so angry and, and, and their, their response to God was not, God, what is it you want to show me? What are you trying to teach me? They became angry and bitter at God. Someone asked C.S. Lewis, why do the righteous suffer? To which he replied, why not? They're the only ones who can take it. So what's the application? I'm going to give you some homework. I want you to write down these three questions. And this week, I want you to answer them in your own time. What happened to me? Simply write down the details of your trials. What is it that has become such a mountain in front of me that I can't seem to move forward? What is the trial that I'm currently in that has crushed me, that's caused me to not be able to see forward, to to get clarity of, of what God is trying to teach you? Write down the details of that trial. And then number two, write this one down. Write down, why am I here on earth? What's the purpose of my life according to God's word? What's the purpose of my life according to God's word? There's a process here. As he's working his will and his way, he's making us more like him. And then thirdly, how can this trial advance that purpose? What can I do today to advance the purpose of displaying the superiority of a life lived in God? What is it that God wants to use this trial to show a world all around me that does not have a relationship with Jesus, who he is, and his power to change and transform lives. Let me encourage you, as you spend time this week writing this stuff down and thinking through this process, let me encourage you to to pray through this passage. Jesus You don't say in your word, if you have trials. He says, whenever you face trials of many kinds, to consider it pure joy. Pray, God, help me understand that it's possible to profit from suffering and trials. Nobody wants to. I'll be honest, I don't even like preaching on this because... Sometimes you almost feel like you're opening up yourselves to attack. But the reality is, is we face trials daily. Over and over and over. God, help me to turn my hardships, my suffering, into times of learning. I know that the testing of my faith 
develops perseverance, steadfastness. Lord, help me to persevere to the very end so that I can finish, it can finish its work so that one day I will be perfect, mature, complete, not lacking anything. If you ask God for wisdom, his word says he gives it generously. And then verse 12 of James 1 says this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive what church? The crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Your trial, your suffering, doesn't go unnoticed. When we're going through it, there's another in the fire. There's, when we're going through the deep waters, He's carrying us. We're going through the trials, he's, he's wrapping in His arms and carrying us through those trials, through those tests. But He says, blessed is that man who remains steadfast under trial. When he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love Him. Let me encourage you. While we wait on those lessons that God is trying to teach us, take every step in obedience towards God. God, I, I want to learn. In the meantime, strive to serve the Savior. Don't let your faith falter. Don't let it faint. Keep on running the race even while you wait. Because he says you'll be blessed. You'll receive the crown of life. If we stand the test. We must remember God can and he'll use this to not only produce steadfastness in us, but we'll use it to encourage and to challenge those all around us. That neighbor who's struggling and doesn't know Christ is watching you. That co-worker that gets on your every last nerve is watching you. That classmate is watching you. That family member who is just at your house for Easter, they're watching you. Those grandkids, grandma and grandpa, are watching you. They're looking to see is there something to grandma's faith. Is there something to my, my granddad's faith? They're watching to see how we respond, how we react, if we turn away from God, or if we dig in deeper in that relationship and lean on the only one who can sustain us. Jesus Christ is the only one, church. Lean in that relationship, and he says, blessed is the one who remains steadfast. Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts this morning?